So what I'd like to do just to start the ball rolling, maybe I'll talk about Fukuoka-san's story. If you've read The One Straw Revolution, he does briefly go into his own personal story that he was, he grew up in a typical, traditional Japanese farming village. And because his father was the, you know, the largest landowner, he had an opportunity to go to college. And he went to an agricultural school. His education was in the top like 1% of agriculture. He studied plant pathology. And he, his first job was in uh, Yokohama, where he was uh, involved with the customs department, <coughs> inspecting plants that were coming in and going out of uh, Japan. And at the time, he said he was just in love with seeing the world through the eyeglass of a microscope. And boy, did his view of science change. And that was that he, had, he got pneumonia and almost passed away. And during that time, he started thinking for the first time about the great issues of life and death and the meaning of life. And then he had this experience one day after he had been wandering all evening. He said that he saw nature pure and clear without it going through the filter of the intellect and with no judgment, just clear. And he, that nature was completely uh, uh, interconnected, it was um, perfectly arranged, and that when people got the idea that they could improve on nature, improve on something which cannot be improved upon, then of course there will be a side effect, and then we try to fix the side effect, and then, it, and then that creates another one, and each one gets larger and larger. So he tried to explain that to his co-workers and to other people, and uh, they didn't understand what he was talking about, because, partly because this was in the 30s that the whole society was heading towards a world that they thought would be full of abundance, you know, and uh, it was a kind of a scientific dream world. So he quit his job, went back to his village, and applied this way of thinking to agriculture. The first thing that happened with him was he had the insight, he had the vision. That is the foundation of natural farming. Everything that follows, follows from this. So there's the vision, and then how, uh, how do you apply that vision to agriculture? Nobody else had done it before he, that he knew. So he had to work out a methodology so how am I going to approach this? He saw that the, that the uh, soil had been eroded down to the subsoil and that there were very few, there was just a few tangerine trees and a few acacia trees. So he knew right off that he was going to start by improving the soil and increasing diversity. What he did was um, uh, sowed seeds and the seeds of many different soil building plants. You know, some with very straight, deep tap roots like uh, uh, burdock and dandelion and so forth. Daikon was his very favorite one. And various mustards, buckwheat and grains and alfalfa and clover, white clover, he grew everywhere. So the idea there was that people had created a problem. If he's going to practice natural farming, and the idea is that he's going to depend on nature's unique ability to create abundance. Nature just when it's whole and can do it, it just keeps providing stuff. You know, the, the indigenous people, they thought they were in, living in paradise because everything that you needed to live was literally just growing on trees. So they worked out a way of living where they tried things and they saw what, how nature responded to that. And they saw when what they did created more abundance and more diversity, and they got that knowledge and passed it down from one generation to the next in an unbroken chain for, for thousands of generations. And natural farming is connected to that line, to that uh, lineage. So natural farming is not the product of Japanese agriculture or organic farming, and it really at its core doesn't have much to do with permaculture or anything, it is directly connected to what indigenous people were doing. And that puts it in a completely different category from any other form of agriculture. I don't even want to refer to natural farming as agriculture or farming, because when we hear those words, we 
kind of want to throw it in with the modern agriculture, which is a controlled, it's all about control and human intention. And the, what indigenous people were doing was more of a partnership with nature. It's more like interacting with the land and uh, tending the wild. So his basic methodology was if what people were doing was causing the problems, then how about stop doing what, what is, what's the problem? And so he looked at agriculture and he said, why are we plowing? Why are we flooding the rice fields? Why are we pruning? Why are we making compost? And eventually he decided that none of those things were useful. So he stopped doing them. So that's part of the methodology that he said, instead of trying this and trying that, it was how about if we didn't do this and didn't do that? So just removing the obstacles so that eventually what was left was nature itself. Nature's uh, predilection is to create the conditions that foster life. That's what nature wants to do. When he first started on his farm, it was he inherited a landscape where nature wasn't whole and he needed first to do the rehabilitation so that nature became whole again. So at the beginning, he had to take some extraordinary measures like he grew chrysanthemum and from that made a pyrethrum, an organic spray to control moths on his vegetables and things like that. And he had to uh, bring in some duck manure, some fertilizer. He had to do some things that as nature was, became whole again, he didn't have to do anymore. So once there was a diversity of, of plants, then he didn't have to do insect control anymore because it became natural insect control. Once he had the ground cover growing, uh, the soil building ground cover, he didn't have to fertilize anymore. And once the soil became soft and, you know, from not plowing his rice fields, then uh, uh, the, the earthworms and the roots of the plants burrowing down, he didn't have to plow anymore. And gradually, he didn't have to do hardly anything anymore except harvest. And that's really the meaning of the do nothing, is that, 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 that all of these uh, gifts return from nature. And it has nothing to do with the physical labor. When he needed the answer to a question, or he had a question like how to do this or that, he just tried things. And what he was asking for is nature to give feedback. Uh, uh, he wasn't trying to figure out how nature worked. He wasn't trying to dissect things into bits and pieces. Like he grew many different, he knew he needed a leguminous ground cover, so he grew about 20 different kinds. And he found it, it was obvious to him that nature was pointing directly at white clover and vetch, just because of various characteristics they had um, that, to help him control weeds as well. And so he went that way, and then he forgot about the rest. You know, when he was spreading, he need, wanted to spread the straw for ground cover. Then at first he, he piled the straw in such neat packs to try to help to control weeds that it also kept the rice from sprouting through. So in that year, he only got a yield of 20 or 25 percent. But he noticed that in one area of the field, the rice came through beautifully. And that was the area where, you know, the rice had been stacked and people were going and collecting the rice and putting it on their shoulder and then carrying it out to the field. So right around there, it was just bits and pieces that had fallen as, as they were grabbing the rice. So that was the way he found out how to do things was nature simply pointed it out to him. And he just went that way. At the beginning, he had no idea what natural farming was gonna look like. So, but he just followed one step after the other. Oh, I'm, I'm being directed in this direction. I'm being directed in this direction. And now we're coming to uh, the, the third. So there's the inspiration and there's the methodology and then about the meaning of natural farming and how we can apply it to our own life. And so the idea of following this signpost that appear in our lives that are just like saying, go this direction and that direction. And they are, they, we, each of us, this is my belief, okay, that there's a, we each have a destiny. 
and the destiny, you follow your own destiny, and that is the easiest path. It's like a do-nothing path. It's like being in the channel, and that, and that some guiding spirit helps us to stay there. And when we take control and we say, okay, that I'm being guided in this direction, but I really want, often it's desire that takes us there, but I really want to go that way, and you go off the path, it becomes much harder. Life becomes harder. You've got to hack through the brush and so forth where you had a clear path over here, but your desire takes you over here. It's harder. So when one of the ways that he decided what to do when, or what not to do when he was developing his farming was if he was doing something that he, and it, it was just too much work then that was an indication that there's a better way to do this. Okay, and the same with our lives. If it's very simple and, and resistance free, then we're, we're in the channel. To practice natural farming, we have to really be in touch with our, the place where we live. We need to know it as, as if it were, you know it intimately. So the way he put it, he put it was, when you come to a piece of land, instead of asking, what can I get from this piece of land? It was, uh, he suggested, how can I serve nature? What does nature need? And, and another way of putting it that he said sometimes is that you simply have a conversation with the land and you ask, what, so what is your destiny? What do you need, what do you, are you compelled to become? What do you want to become? in this place and then you take and then you combine that with your own needs and desires and together you grow so you grow together like you're in one family and uh, to do that you have to be in touch with yourself and this is another whole area about how do we embody the, the ideals of natural farming into our own lives? That he went back to diet a lot because the, uh, his, his overall view was without natural people, you, is, you can't have natural farm. And that was much more important than how many pounds of clover per quarter acre. You know, you can see that this, is, this was much bigger. It was how to improve human beings because it's the human beings that sort of went off on the wrong path and caused the problem. So we have to stop doing what we were doing and the way to do that, the best way, or the only way, is to reconnect with ourselves so we won't be doing those things anymore. He was a spiritual person, but not particularly religious. And, but he, he really highly respected people of, of true religious faith. He didn't ask us or any of his students to follow a path. There was no required reading. There, was no, there were no real rules. It, he, for people that were living at his farm, there weren't rules like uh, telling people how the practice was the farming and doing what you need to do to supply the needs for everyday life. <coughs> His idea was that people would find their way in their own way in their own time. And so he wasn't big on setting a, a bunch of rules, although he did expect people to work and to take care of the tools and to do all of those very basic things, but there was nothing about no drinking on the farm, you know, no smoking or know that you have to meditate for an hour or you know these the, he he wasn't in that wasn't him it just wasn't him uh people responded to that and and they enjoyed being treated you know and nobody abused that at all while i was there